In the, the end of each year, Pastor Joe and I get together for a day or so, and we plan out the preaching schedule for the following year. And we have some materials and things that we use to, to help us plan that. And in those are included the bumper that you just saw and the graphics and videos and different things and also some themes. Now, it doesn't uh, give us all of the sermons. We have to prepare our own sermons. But we, we do this for several reasons. One is that both locations are learning the same or similar things uh, week in and week out. Pastor Joe might not and I might not preach the exact same message, but we're using the same text with the same theme. We call that growing in the same direction. Even though we're in two different locations, we're growing in the same direction as God is leading us. One of the interesting things about the materials that we use is it gives us a lot of different options. But as we looked at, we wanted to preach something from the Old Testament. Uh, one of the things that came up was the book of Amos. Now, I don't know if I was planning the series all on my own without Pastor Joe and without some other input that I would ever pick the book of Amos to do a six-week series from. I might do a quick overview of the book of Amos, but it's not necessarily one that I would automatically think of. But as we've been preparing this for several weeks now and looking at the book of Amos and thinking about it, wow, how awesome it is that the word of God, although Amos was written, I think, in the 650 B.C., 650 B.C., I'm not sure, but you can ask Liz right after the service. Uh, she'll help you with that. But So that was 1,000, 2,600 years ago, let's say. And as you'll see, it's just as relevant to us today. Now, the circumstances are different. The people are different. But there are so many similarities to what we're facing today. So in the next six weeks, I'm going to ask you, there's only, I think, nine chapters in the book of Amos. Uh, take some time in your private time to read the book of Amos. And let me tell you this, don't get overwhelmed by what you don't understand. Find the points that you do understand and that God is revealing to you. Because you'll read some of it and you'll say, well, that, I don't even know what that means. Well, don't stop there. Just keep going. There's something in the book of Amos that God wants to reveal to you. And we, we call it not revelation, but illumination. Revelation is something new. Illumination is when God shines a light on his word so that we understand it better than we did before. So we're going to be looking at this at both campuses. We're going to be looking at the uh, book of Amos. And the big idea that we're going to look at is that God is the only one with the authority to set the standards by which we're able to live by. God is the only one with the authority to set the standards for nations and for individuals uh, that we are to, to live by. And so because God has this standard of morality, we have to submit to his standards. We have to do what's right, no matter what the circumstances and no matter what society says, because their society back then was different people but it's funny how similar it is. See, it was a different time period. They, they could not even begin to comprehend the technology we have. It would be like an alternate reality to them, although they wouldn't know the term alternate reality. You know, imagine somebody from 2,600 years ago coming to America today. I mean, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. And yet, we see God is the same. People tend to be the same. So God's principles are still the same, whether it was 2,600 years ago or whether it was for us today. Well, I found this video. It's, it's a little longer than what I usually show on Sunday morning. It's about seven minutes. So I'm going to actually cut my sermon seven minutes shorter, okay? Oh, there you go. Thanks, Doug. He's just excited Villanova won the championship. That's all, right? Doug's a Villanova alumnus, so, uh, but, but, the reason I'm showing it is because it gives the single best overview of the book of Amos or any book that I've ever seen in my life. That's how good it is. And it puts it in a way that even I can understand it. So we're going to show that video at this time and uh, just watch that. And then I'm going to fill in some of the blanks uh, for you as we go on. 
But some things never change, and that's what we were, we were talking about. People don't change that much. The same sin that befell Adam and Eve are still the temptations that we face. God's principles also stay the same. People fall into the traps, but God's promises are still true. We're going to look at some of the principles that God has established for mankind. Now, this is hugely important in our society today as not an overwhelming number, but more and more people are not just falling away from the Lord, but they're pursuing agnosticism and atheism. Now, an atheist is someone that believes there is no God. An agnostic is someone that they're not sure probably most people that we run into that might call themselves atheists are more not well-read agnostics because they, they are not, not quite ready to say there is no God, but they're not sure that there is a God. That would be an agnostic. An atheist is one that completely disbelieves. And still the percentages are the same that they've always been. In fact, uh, in New Jersey, there's about 2 or 3% of the 8 million population, this is a recent study, that are atheists. That's all. Just 2 or 3%. It just ha- and it's the same for the nation as a whole, maybe 4%, 5%. It just happens that a lot of those atheists are located in New York City and in Los Angeles. And you know why that's important? Because they control the media. And so the media makes it seem like there's a lot more people that don't believe in God that are against Christianity, when in reality that's very far from the truth. Even in New Jersey, 70% of people Uh, believe in God, believe in Jesus. Now, they might not live their lives like that. They might not be born again in the sense that that we would say. But overall, most people in the neighborhood of 86 to 93% believe in God, okay? So, but what's going on, especially uh, with our young people and in colleges and in universities that are also run by those that are completely opposed to God, is they're taking what they have learned in church and at home, and they're, they're putting them, you know, into all of these situations to get them to doubt their, their beliefs. Now, isn't it interesting that a professor with a PhD would take advantage of an 18-year-old student to try to confuse them in their beliefs without presenting both sides of the story. I mean, imagine a a uh, 50-year-old man or woman uh, with an 18-year-old forcing them into something that they didn't want to do. What would happen to them? They would be in jail, and yet they mess with so many minds. So a lot of young people go away to college having grown up in church, but listen, they've believed in Jesus but never known Jesus. That's the first reason. Okay. The second reason is they're inundated with uh, uh, immorality in a way that they've never experienced before. It's their first time away from home with any sort of freedom. And I even saw this. I got to keep on focus here, but I, I will make this main point. I even saw it when I was in Bible school. You could see that the kids that had some freedom growing up were fine and adjusted fine. The kids that had no freedom growing up exploded when they got to school because they had never been allowed to do anything. And we had a joke, they were, this is really rotten. This is rotten, but they were all good ping pong players because they weren't allowed to do anything else when they were growing up. And so you didn't want to play, you know, anyway. I guess it was funnier back then, I don't know. Maybe it's too, too real today, but anyway. But what would happen is they, they couldn't balance their life because they had never had balance in their life that everything was scripted for them and everything was, they were told what to do at every moment of every day. When they got some freedom, they couldn't handle the, f- the freedom, okay? That's in a Christian school. Imagine these secular universities that promote alcohol and whether they say they do or not, college life, that's what they say college is. Oh, I can't wait to go to college and I can't wait to get out on my own so I can drink as much as I want and party as much as I want. It's part of the culture at the schools, and it's just, just the way that it is. I'm really going to step on some toes here, but people are going crazy about different things going on in our society, and alcohol kills more people than, than anything. Drunk driving kills more people than, than most things other than, like, you know, cancer and heart disease. Uh, but anyway, that immorality comes in, and so then they get to a professor that is trained and is a Ph.D., They're right out of high school, 
right out of home for the first time, and they hear these things that are opposite of what they've been taught at home and in church, and they don't have the resources or the tools to be able to combat that. And that's why a lot of them fall away. First of all, they, want, they, they never knew the Lord. They knew a little bit about the Lord, not enough to sustain them. They have freedom for the first time. Sin confronts them in a way that they've never experienced before. And they were always taught that if you sin, you'll be punished, and yet they see their friends involved in the worst type of sin possible, and yet on Monday, they're fine. What they don't realize is that sin does have consequences, and those that live for sin, the wrath of God is already upon them. It just hasn't caught up to them. Because what you do on Saturday night might not catch up to you on Monday. But the wrath of God is already upon you, and eventually it will catch up to you. Okay, and we've all lived long enough to know this is true. And here's why I'm saying all of this is because there are objective standards that God has established that are principles for every nation and every person on earth. Okay, let me walk you through this because I want you to be clear on this. He is God the creator. Therefore, he has to, the right to establish what is right and wrong. Why do you think secular culture and uh, atheistic evolution is so prevalent and people are so passionate about atheistic evolution? Because if you take God out of the equation, you take accountability out of the equation. It's all just the Adam and Eve thing. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it without any consequences. We want to be God. It all boils down to that. Now watch, keep, keep with me. But without God, there is no objective standard of right and wrong. Without the moral standards of God, there is no objective standard. Now, that's not to say that you have to believe in God to do good because there are atheists that do good things, okay? They do good things. There are people that, don't, that aren't Christians that do good things. Many people who do not believe in God do good things, but is there good without God? And here, here it breaks down to, if, if I were to lie to you, Okay? If I were to lie to Greg, okay, we would all know that that was wrong. Greg, right as soon as I'm done preaching, I'm going to have the cheesesteak for you. And it's the best cheesesteak that you've ever eaten. And you all know that that's not true. And Greg gets all excited, but I've just lied to him. And you would all say, oh, that's terrible. Why do you know lying is wrong? Why does everyone know that lying is wrong? Because it's an objective standard that God has established, okay? Who's got a 20, $20 bill? Somebody got a 20, not you, Greg, your college student. Who's got a $20 bill? I don't need a one because that doesn't make the point. A five isn't what it used to be. Got a 20? Thanks. Now, why would it matter if I left and never gave this back to John? Because we all know that stealing is wrong. Right or wrong? You all said, oh, well, you knew I was coming back because you know the punchline. But what if I just walked out and I never gave it back and I went and did whatever I wanted to do with it? What if it was $200? What if it was more? Why do we all know that that's wrong? Because of God's objective standard. Okay, look how this plays out in subjective standards. Let me have that 20 again. <laughs> what if I said, you know what, I'm just going to keep it because my opinion is my opinion. And what's right for me might not be right for you, but who are you to tell me that taking John's money is wrong? Why is it wrong? Because it's God's objective standard. That stealing is wrong. Lying is wrong because God is a God of truth. Okay, stealing is wrong is because God is a God of honesty. You see? You see how all this plays in? How about this? Why does everybody believe that murder of innocent people is wrong? Other than, I don't, I don't want to get into abortion again, but other than that, that people believe that. Why do people believe that murder of innocent people is wrong? We see it on TV and we go, oh, that is terrible. And it is. It's horrible. 
Because God is a God of life. Again, why do we all know that killing someone is wrong? Because it's God's objective standard. And yet we have people like Stalin, who happened to be an atheist, that killed 20, 10 to 20 million of his own people. Why do we know that's wrong? Because of God. Can atheists do good? Yes. But they don't have any objective standard for why they do good. Are you with me? Why is stealing wrong? Because God set the standard. Why can't I just keep John's money? It's my opinion. Well, because there's something beyond my subjective opinion. It's God's standard. Why can't I just walk in? This is terrible. Why can't I just walk into somewhere and kill someone? Because I believe it's right. Stalin thought he was doing what was right. Hitler thought he was doing what was right. In fact, in his demonic mind, he thought he was doing the Lord's work, maybe. Maybe. Why was what he did wrong? Because of God's objective standard. Because Hitler would say, what I'm doing is right. When you take God out of the equation, then who establishes the principles of right and wrong? Either we establish them or who's ever in power establishes them, which is scary. And that was Stalin and Hitler. Do you understand what I'm saying? God, watch, God has the right to set right and wrong because he's the creator. Therefore, the enemy comes up with atheistic evolution to take God out of the equation. Then the enemy comes up with subjective truth. What's right for you might not be right for me. There are no there is no absolute truth. There are no moral objectives. Everything is subjective. And so we can do whatever we feel is right. Well, maybe I felt it was right to take John's 20 and go out and get something to eat. Maybe I felt that that doesn't make it right. And someday, even though I thought it was right to steal John's money, I'm going to have to give an account to God. See? See? And so it's not just the courts on earth that I have to answer to. It's the court in heaven that ultimately I'm going to have to answer to. Okay, here's the larger point. Because God created, he has the right or the authority to determine what's right or wrong. He has established objective principles that are right and wrong. If you break those principles, you will be held accountable. Now we'll get to the book of Amos. Watch. You will be held accountable for right and wrong, whether you are a heathen nation or a covenant nation, see? Whether you're Damascus in Assyria or you're Jerusalem in Judah, if you break God's standards, you will suffer the consequences. Whether you're someone that has never been to church and has decided in their own mind that they are God, they'll do what they want when they want, they are still going to have to stand before God and give account, or whether you grew up in church and just choose to do wrong, you're going to have to stand before God. Why? Because it's his standards that matter. It's not societal standards. If societal standards were right, then 60 million abortions since 1973 would be something to be celebrated. Instead, we're horrified by it. And you cannot read Amos about what God is going to do to the nations that killed children and think that America is going to get off easy. America, probably we are already being held responsible for the death of 60 million innocents. And I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I'm not going to review it. Watch it on YouTube. Okay? But... What was happening here, and I'm going to start drawing this to a conclusion. What time is it? Somebody has to fix that clock in the back, please. Uh, I lost my thought. Oh, so when you're reading the book of Amos, here's what was happening. And you saw it, that all of the nations that he's talking about were all around Israel. So as Amos is preaching, let me just list some of the nations. I don't have time to get into all their different things. You'll have to read it on your own. But uh, Syria, they had often harassed Israel. So Amos is preaching against Syria and the Israelites are going, yeah, that's right. They're horrible. Remember what they did to us? And then he starts preaching against the Philistines who had sold the Israelites into slavery. 
I had family members that were taken from their homes and sold into slavery, those nasty, rotten, stinking Philistines. And then the people of Phoenicia had broken their peace what they had a covenant with Israel. They're liars. They can't keep their promises. Those people are horrible. And this is, while Amos is preaching, the crowd's getting louder. And they're cheering him and they're saying, yeah, those nations are rotten. Those nations are evil. And then Edom, they murdered so many of the Jews and we're, God's gonna get them. Oh God, just pour out your wrath upon those evil nations. And Ammon, the Ammonites had murdered Jewish women. Moab had desecrated the tombs of the dead because they worshiped the dead and not life. And the people are cheering as Amos is preaching. He's right preach. They're horrible, rotten people. And then next week, I'm going to share this. He pinpoints the nations of Judah and Israel that were God's covenant people. And he says this, you're worse than they are because you know better. Wow. You're worse than they are. And here's your sins. See, isn't it easy for us if we make it personally to look at our neighbor and say, oh, what a rotten, miserable wreck they are. They're horrible, they're terrible and all of that. But it's much harder to look inside and say, wow, I have some of those same attitudes. Maybe I don't go out and get drunk every Saturday, but, you know, I want to I wanna push the line. I, I, I want to do whatever I want to do. Maybe I would never go out and kill someone, but, man, I hate those people that do it. And if I had the chance, I would kill them myself. Whoa. Oh, easy now. Easy. So Amos is saying he's preaching this and they're all excited. Yeah. And then he, then he announces the judgment that God's going to pour out on them. And because again, objective standards. Even though the Philistines didn't know Jehovah God, they were still held to those objective standards because murder is always wrong, whether you're a pagan or a believer. Okay? And so they're still going to be held accountable to that. And all the Israelites, all the, all the, the good, can I, church people were saying, yeah, God, get them. Yeah, God, get them. Yeah, God, get them. But next week, we're going to see how Amos begins to pinpoint most of what he wants to say over the people of God. Because we are held to those standards, to a higher standard, because we have the word of God and not just the book but the word of Jesus Christ. Here's the bottom line for today, and I'll move into communion. Is that apart from the grace of God, you'll have heard this before, apart from the grace of God, we are all miserable, rotten, stinking sinners. The only thing that makes us different than the people in the world is that we've been saved by God's grace. Without Jesus Christ, even though you come to church on Sunday morning and you dress nice and you clap and sing, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, you are no better in God's eyes than anyone else that's living however they want to live. And if we do have relationship with God through grace, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, then we are certainly not to be the ones to judge everyone else because we have things in our own life. That's what Amos is saying. And guess what? The nation of Israel was going to be judged and they were severely judged. Now that's gonna come about four or five weeks in, but they were severely judged. Why? Because God has standards and they must be followed or we'll pay the consequences. So here we sit today, 2,600 years later, hope assembly. What does this mean to us? It means we're all rotten, miserable, stinking sinners. But if you've accepted Christ, he no longer sees you that way. And what happened is, now watch, those nations and all nations that oppose the things of God, God's wrath is on them and they will ultimately be destroyed. Every nation that establishes something else other than the leadership of God will ultimately be destroyed, okay? Every individual that does not establish God in his life through Christ, you understand what I'm saying, salvation, the wrath of God is upon them, every individual. Here's the difference for believers. Jesus took all of that wrath 
for all of the things that we've ever done wrong. He took that on the cross in our place for our salvation. That's the difference. That's what's so wonderful about Christianity. Christianity is not we're perfect. We're still a mess. That's why we still need God, need the church, need each other. We're still a mess. What Christianity says is we're forgiven that the wrath of God was put upon Jesus so that I will never experience the wrath of God. Have I broken God's standards? Yes. Have I done what's wrong? Yes. Have I chosen to do what's wrong? Yes. Have I enjoyed doing wrong? Yes. But when we accept Christ, he forgives us of all of our sins and we never have to worry about the wrath of God because he took the wrath of God on the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate today at communion. We don't celebrate that we're good people. We don't celebrate that we're better than our neighbor. We celebrate that Jesus is good, and that Jesus is wonderful, and that Jesus is gracious, and he gives us what we don't deserve, and he's merciful, and that we don't get what we do deserve. We celebrate Jesus. That's what makes the difference. And so I think we, we all, myself included, because I've grown up in church, I struggle with all these things, of judging and condemning others and wishing ill on others because they break the standards of God, we need to have change of heart. We need to stop looking at people through our own eyes and start looking at them through God's eyes. And even for the nations and the neighbors that are far from God, God would that none should perish. He doesn't rejoice in the destruction of the nations. He doesn't rejoice in the destruction of, of anyone. He would that none should perish. Oh God, oh God, Give us your eyes. Give us your ears and give us your heart for those that are lost because we too would be lost without Jesus Christ. No, oh Lord, give us a passion to tell others that they can have hope, hope in Jesus Christ. People know that they've done wrong. People know that they've made horrendous mistakes. You don't have to remind them. Your family member that screwed up so many times, you don't have to remind them. They know that. What they need is hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ, that he's taken their punishment. He's taken their wrath. And if they would receive and accept, then they could stand rightly before him. Amos is a powerful, powerful book. Powerful. You need to read it. You need to get out of it what it's saying don't worry about what you don't understand. Focus on what you do and let God the Holy Spirit make it come to light in your life in these next few weeks. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.